It's a story that started 17 years ago, in the year 2000, in a class filled with management students of one of the top B schools in India. The students were keenly listening to the professor, teaching them a very fascinating case, something called the prisoner's dilemma. In order to make the class more interesting, the professor asked all the students to imagine themselves to be one of the two criminals who have joined hands together to commit a crime that would change their lives forever. To the students, it sounded like a big Bollywood blockbuster. But the professor immediately gave a plot twist. The two of you have been caught, not while committing the crime, but rather while trying to run away from the scene of crime. So the police have a doubt on you, but is not very sure about it. The two of you have been kept in two different rooms. You have the free will to confess to the crime or to remain silent. What would you do? The students were very sharp at it. They knew the choice was obvious. So they unanimously stated we would remain silent. The professor gave a very sly smile and now introduced himself into the story as the third character, the wicked jailer, who comes to you and now gives you an offer of a lifetime. He says, why don't you join hands with me? Why don't you confess and rat out on your partner? In which case, we would be able to help, uh, we would be able to resolve the case. We would go set you free. And in that case, your partner gets 10 years. What would you do now? Immediately, the unanimity of the class broke down. The class got divided into remaining silent or confessing to the crime now. But the professor added on another twist and said, but, if you confess and your partner also confesses, then your confession is of not much use to us. In which case, both of you will get five years. The student again started thinking about it. And the wicked jailer gave another round. And he said, you also have the options of remaining silent, both of you remaining silent. In which case, we may not be able to convict you for the said crime, but we'll definitely charge you for the public property damages. In which case, both of you will get one year. The students knew that it was not all over and they were expecting one more round and the wicked jailer gave them. The jailer said that I'm going to go to your partner and give, them, give him the same conditions. And if you remain silent and your partner confesses, he goes free and then you get 10 years of jail. What would you do? Now one would assume that this situation of multi-dimensional you know, uh, technicalities would have confused the young management students. But no, they are uh, MBA students, and MBA students are sharp, as we all know. Pat came the reply, and everybody, almost 90% of the class shouted, we would confess. The most popular student in the class even went on to elaborate his decision. He said the choices are actually very simple. If I confess, the two possibilities are zero years or five years. If I remain silent, the two possibilities are one year and 10 years. And since zero years is better than one year and five years is better than 10 years, I'm going to confess since I don't know what is the choice that the other person is going to make. So I'm going to feel safe when I confess. Silence. Followed by a huge round of applause by the entire class. The class erupted in joy and appreciation and even the professor's eyes gleamed with a lot of pride and he said, from a self-entrusted perspective, any rational mind would do the same any rational mind would do the same. That one st sentence would have done a lot of good to the young management student's aspirations and confidence. Of course, he was right. Of course, the professor was right, because that's how most of the decisions are taken by the governments, by the mathematicians, by the economists. But nobody in that uproar observed that one student who was sitting in the last row, corner seat, who could not understand even a single bit out of it. Who had chosen to remain silent no matter what the jailer offered. And he kept wondering, why is everyone so sure that the other person would have cheated? Isn't it better that we, together, we, the two of us, suffer a small loss of one year imprisonment, but in the process, build up a lifelong relationship? He also wondered that why is it that people can't see that both of them gain more by trusting than by cheating. 
He couldn't ask those questions because he was too scared to ask that question in, 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 in the middle of the rational minds. That night, that student could not sleep. Not because the incident had questioned his academic abilities. He wasn't good at it anyway. <laughs> not because he couldn't feel, he couldn't figure out that the prisoner's dilemma was not about trust, but primarily because he kept wondering what would have been the hypothetical decision made by the other person. He just could not get those answers. He kept questioning, are people really, really not trustworthy? Would people ditch you if you trusted them? And is it really irrational to trust people? He did not have those answers, but the good news was he could find the way to find the answers. He realized that he would not be able to find the answers by not trusting people because then he wouldn't know the outcome. Therefore, he decided to trust everyone. For the next 17 years of his life, he kept on trusting everybody whom he met. At times it was disappointing. At times it was even earth shattering. At times it was very scary, but he went on and on. And after 17 years of this lifelong experiment, on 13th of May, at 1.21 p.m., that person stands on one of the most prestigious platforms in this world, TED Talks, stands right in front of you and shares with you this idea of trusting people. And I'm so glad to tell you it has been totally worth it. <laughs> now, I'm not dead. I'm, I'm very much alive. And the fact that I'm alive and kicking proves one thing for sure, that trusting people doesn't kill you. Thank God for that. <laughs> also, today I'm financially independent. I'm the founder director of two successfully running organizations. But most importantly, I'm extremely happy to announce that I can claim to be the happiest person alive. And I ascribe trusting people as one of the biggest contributors to that success of happiness. Allow me to take you along on this journey. The first thing that I realized in this journey was that life must not and should not and cannot be taken as a real life prisoner's dilemma. It is not. Because in prisoner's dilemma, it's a one-on-one -on -one situation. In life, it is not. Every day, every month, every year, we meet so many people that our lives cannot be relied on one person's one decision. So let's say, on an average, we meet around 100 people on an average in a month. Now, since we don't know them, I understand that we cannot trust all of them. All of them would not be trustworthy. I realize that. And for all practical reasons, I would not assume them to be trustworthy. But for the same practical reasons, I cannot assume them not to be trustworthy. My experiences over the last 17 years taught me that out of 100 people, there are only 5 to 10 people who are then genuinely not trustworthy. These people whose intentions are bad, those who want to ditch you at the drop of a hat, whose idea of a transaction is a win-loss situation and not a win-win situation. Let's say if there is a spectrum of truth, something called a spectrum of truth, I would put all of them on the leftmost corner of it. So therefore, these 5 to 10 people occupy that space. Does it mean that I'm saying that the remaining 90 to 95 people are trustworthy? No, I am not, because I'm not a fool. My experience was that the other end of the spectrum was also occupied by only 5 to 10 people, only, not more than that. So what happens to the remaining 80 to 90 people? Yeah, they don't matter. Actually, they just get you know, distributed across this entire spectrum of tr uh, trust. Let me share a very interesting th thing with you about human behavior. We humans automatically assume the position of center in everyone's life. We assume that everybody is after my life and therefore gives me so much of attention that every action of the other person would be directed towards me, either for the positive or for the negative. But the truth is, they are not even looking at you. We are the ones who were the heroes and heroines of our stories. In their own stories, they are the heroes and heroines. I am just that extra. I am just a, that extra person with whom they come, transact for once and go, you know, go, back, go back home. The best, the closest that I can tell you is, I am just like Gunther for friends. 
Precisely. The Rachels and the Joys and the channels, channels of the world, they go back home. I, am, I just serve them coffee and my role in their lives is over. So coming back to the spectrum of trust, it was as simple as it's a normally distributed curve where five to 10 people are not trustworthy, five to 10 people are extremely trustworthy, rest of them I don't even know. Now, if I as a person have developed trust issues, the interesting thing is my trust or mistrust would not follow a definite pattern. It doesn't. It is not like that I'm going to trust all even number people in my life. I'm not going to trust all large number people, people, in, people in my life. Or, funny enough, I'm going to trust only those people who come at prime number locations at my point of view know, and meet me. No, it doesn't happen that way. If I don't trust people, I'm just not going to trust those people. These people are not going to carry a tag of untrustworthiness. So therefore, in order to save myself from the deceits, from the betrayals, I am going to build a wall against each one of them. And in this entire process, I might think that I have saved myself from the untrustworthy people. I am also building a wall against the trustworthy ones. And this is where the important aspect of element of surprise comes in place. The element of surprise, trust me guys, is always in the hand of the culprit is always in the hand of the criminal, is always in the hands of the cheater. So if somebody decides to cheat me, is would be able to cheat me. And therefore, at the end of a particular period's transaction, you know what is going to happen? Out of those five to 10 people, it is almost inevitable that one or two would be able to cheat me. But you know what is worse is not this pain of deceit. It is actually that I'm alone in that pain of deceit. I do not have any relationship that would back me and thereby I end up feeling even more angrier for the next round of 100 transactions where I build an even longer, even higher, even stronger wall. And imagine what kind of person would I develop to be. I would end up becoming a person who is grumpy, who is suspecting, who is sullen, who does not trust people and what is there in my account? All deceits, all betrayals, no relationships. On the other hand, if I trust people, I would trust all of them. Because I don't know whether they're trustworthy or not, so I don't care about it. I'll trust all of them. And while the conditions of betrayal still remain the same, there are always those five to 10 people with whom I've built a relationship who are going to back me up even if there is somebody who dece deceives me. In which case, imagine, have I actually lost anything? But it doesn't end there. Actually, a more important role is played at this point of time by those 80 to 90 those people for whom I was an unconcerned fellow. But you know what? While these people live their own lives, they're also struggling to identify whom to trust and whom not to. And when they saw my open arms, they held on to those arms. And therefore, I'm not saying all 80 to 90 of them, but at least five to 10 more people, they built a relationship with me. And therefore, at the end of every period, my balance sheet, my profit and loss account, account statement was around one to two ditches and around 10 to 20 relationships. I might be bad at accounting, but I'm very sure this is a profitable scenario. I would also like to, and I feel I'm obliged to, spend two minutes of my talk for all those skeptics who might believe that this theory doesn't work. Let me tell you, I'm not a fool. I might look like one, but I'm not, all right? Because I know for a fact that trust is not equal to blind faith. Because today, if I trust you people, it is just to identify whether I can trust you tomorrow or not. Always remember that choosing to be vulnerable is not equal to being vulnerable. When I make a conscious decision to be vulnerable and put my trust in your hand, I'm also following your actions. I'm observant to what you are going to do. I'm not a fool that way that you would keep cheating me. Because the rule of my life has actually become extremely clear. You cheat me once, shame on you. You cheat me twice, shame on me. Because then I am not capable to identify your actions, which is not the case. And trust me, what my experience over the last 17 years has been that people are too scared to lose a relationship in which the other person trusts you. Because we, are, we started living in a society where people don't trust each other. Just look at the society. Look at the society that we live in. Kids, very early in their childhood, they start getting instructions from their family not to trust anyone else. You know, every mother, every morning, 
while packing the tiffin of, for the kids gives that parental guidance. Do not share your tiffin with your friends. They'll eat theirs and they'll eat yours as well. Do you understand what happens to the kid? The kid goes to the school and the schools aren't any better either. You know, we have unnecessarily been forced to believe in a competition that may or may not exist. That student would go ahead of you. No, that student is not going ahead of you because he is not trustworthy. He is getting the rewards of his efforts. You are going to get the rewards of your effort. Why can't people understand that? The same problem keeps haunting people when they re reach colleges. How many times have we heard statements like, these are the best years of your life? Because once you reach the corporate world, you're not going to file real friends. Imagine what we have inculcated immediately. And immediately, because of all these things, we start hating our corporate world. We don't trust them. And you know what? The image of demonic bosses and conniving colleagues, it becomes so vividly painted in our minds that we start assuming that closing up is the best option possible. Is this the kind of society that we want to live in? Is this the kind of workplace that we want to build a professional career? I chose no. And therefore, I started trusting everyone. I trusted everyone. I trusted my colleagues. I trusted my erstwhile bosses. I trusted my co-director. Co I trusted my, uh, my students, my clients. I even trusted my relatives. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't regret that. Because it was because of that trust that we were able to create a workplace which was a happy workplace. Wherein I am so extremely proud to share that I have been told that the workplace where, you know, by company, Edicorp, it has been labeled as a sweet little place, a happy place, the happiest office, not by me, not by my co-director, but by our clients, our students, and believe it or not, by the people who work there. It gave me the courage to move ahead and set up an agenda for the corporates, for the colleges, for the schools, to create happy workplaces. And I started working towards it. I want to create workplaces where people and team members can trust each other, where the employees trust their bosses, the bosses trust their employees, the teachers trust their students, and the students know that their teachers trust them. So that when they're asked to identify their moments of happiness, they don't have to look back into the past. They can look at their present, and they can also look at the future that this is going to be a happy moment for them. In the end, I really want to tell you people that you know what has started happening? <laughs> we have actually started, li started living in a place where everybody seems to be fighting a battle. And the worst part is that the, in this battle, the opponent does not even have a face. We don't even know whom are we fighting with. I really fail to understand when did this happen that we started fighting a battle without a face. Every world seems to be our opponent. Do we want to li live like this? Because I believe that we, all of us, should try and trust people and give them a reason so that they, they can trust us back. You know, each one of them is fighting their own battle. I don't think we should become another battle for them to fight. I believe this entire idea is totally worth it. I believe that this dream is the one that can be achieved. I believe this is the idea that must be spread. Trust me. Thank you so much.